anterior shoulder instability in the management of bone loss. The shoulder is kept in joint by a complex equilibrium of forces. When the shoulder dislocates anteriorly, the anterior inferior capsule is torn, often taking off a small post piece of bone known as a bankart lesion, with the reciprocal damage to the posterior aspect of the humeral head, the heel sax lesion. Often this bone loss is relatively modest and if a stabilisation is required, a standard soft tissue procedure will work satisfactorily. However, in certain situations where the anterior glenoid bone loss is past a certain threshold, the soft tissue procedure itself will not be sufficient to stabilise the shoulder. This may be compromised further if there is a significant hill sax lesion that engages with the bone loss anteriorly. The significance of bone loss and the failure of anterior instability surgery was first highlighted by Burkett and De Beer. They looked at 194 arthroscopic stabilisations. Of those that have failed, they then stratified those to the ones that had significant bone loss and those that didn't have bone loss. When stratifying this, they found that the failure rate in patients that only had a small amount of bone loss was less than 4%. However, if the bone loss was past a certain threshold that they described as an inverted pair, which accounted for about 25% of the glenoid, then the failure rate increased to 61%. So when deciding what is going to be the most appropriate procedure for a patient with a recurrent instability preoperatively, it's important to assess the amount of bone loss both anteriorly on the glenoid side and also posteriorly in the hill sax lesion. Currently, the best system to assess the interplay between glenoid and humeral bone loss is the glenoid track system. When the shoulder is fully abducted and externally rotated, the footprint is in contact with the posterior 16% of the glenoid, meaning the length of humeral head in contact with the glenoid accounts for 84% of the glenoid width. This is essentially the glenoid track. If the heel sax lesion sits within the glenoid tract when the shoulder is abducted and externally rotated, it will not engage with the front of the glenoid. However, if any part of the heel sax lesion lies anterior to the glenoid track, it will engage. This is compounded further if there is significant glenoid bone loss as the width of the glenoid tract is decreased. This is a reformatted CT scan of a patient with anterior and posterior bone loss. We can see that the anterior bone loss D effectively means that the glenoid tract has been reduced by 83% minus D. When we look at the hill sax lesion, we can see that that lies outside of the glenoid tract, so this hill sax lesion will engage. Whilst preoptive CT scans and imaging can give a good indication as to whether there is significant bone loss that will compromise a soft tissue procedure, there is no substitute for the diagnostic arthroscopy. In this arthroscopy of a right shoulder, we are undertaking a revision stabilisation. You can see that the heel sax lesion is engaging with the anterior edge of the glenoid where the previous soft tissue stabilisation was performed. The current surgical procedures available to treat significant bone loss are aimed at the anterior glenoid and or the heel sax lesion posteriorly. On the anterior side, the most commonly Performed procedures are either a straightforward bone block procedure or a coracoid transfer. The rationale of the bone block procedure is essentially to extend the glenoid arc, so as the arm comes into abduction external rotation, the heel sax lesion no longer engages with the front of the glenoid. The most commonly performed bone block procedure are variations of the eden hibernay procedure. This is commonly undertaken either using an autograph, which is normally a tricortical iliac crest graft, or an allograft that is simply screwed on to the front of the glenoid. There are less commonly performed bone block procedures, the most popular being the J-graft, which was popularised by Resch, which essentially involves using a crafted iliac crest autograft that is inserted into an osteotomy performed at the front of the glenoid and then held in position by repairing the capsule. Another commonly but more technically demanding procedure is a coracoid transfer. This involves undertaking an osteotomy of the tip of the coracoid and then attaching this with the conjoint tendon to the front of the glenoid. This has the additional benefit of not only increasing the arc of rotation but also the conjoint tendon working as a dynamic sling. There are two variations of the coracoid transfer. The Bristow procedure, which essentially secures the coracoid tip end-on, and the Lattier procedure that secures the coracoid side-on. 
Both of these will extend the glenoid arc and also give the dynamic sling effect in the conjoint tendon. The perceived advantage of the coracoid transfer over the simple bone plot procedure is the dynamic sling effect. It has been noted that the failure rate of uh, straightforward soft tissue bank art repairs for contact athletes is higher than would be expected. These factors are taken into consideration in the Instability Severity Index which looks at not only bone loss but also the age of athletes, their activity and evidence of hyperlaxity. A score of six or more gives a very high likelihood that a simple soft tissue procedure on its own will fail and that coracoid transfer is then indicated. One of the main issues with both bone block procedures and coracoid transfers are screw complications. They can be compromised to the brachial plexus at the time of surgery and potential damage to the suprascapular nerve with posterior penetration of the glenoid and also screw breakage and impingement. Sometimes bone block fractures do occur when tightening the screws. Another issue is that many patients with significant instability do go on to develop osteoarthritis and there may be some problems uh, down the line with a total shoulder replacement and metalwork in situ within the glenoid. One of the main causes of screw complications is incorrect positioning at the time of surgery. It's often underappreciated that the glenoid is retroverted and the scapula is protracted. So that even using specialised drill guides, it is often the case that screws are put in too laterally. Looking at this post-operative axial x-ray of a left shoulder that has undergone a latter jay procedure, we can see that the version of the glenoid was underappreciated. As a result, the screws have gone in far too laterally, so that they, now call, they are now causing impingement on the humeral head. Another not uncommon problem is screw breakage. This can occur if the graft has not been prepared properly and does not unite. A recent development for bone block procedures and coracoid transfers is a suture button fixation technique using a posterior drill guide. Using this system, accurate drill holes can be made from back to front parallel to the glenoid. The bone for the bone block procedure or the coracoid transfer can then be securely fixed using a suture button compression system which does not leave any metal work within the glenoid. This is a post-operative x-ray of an arthroscopic bristol lache procedure that I performed using the suture button fixation technique. And you can see on the axial CT scan that the bone has healed very nicely and there's no metal work within the glenoid. In this revision case you can see that the suture buttons nicely bypass the pre-existing metal anchors no further metal work was left within the glenoid. For an Eden Hibernay procedure, an all arthroscopic technique can be used through the rotator interval. This has the advantage of not having to split subscapularis, not dissecting through the anterior compartment. This postoperative x ray demonstrates an arthroscopic all Eden Hibernay procedure in a patient that already had pre existing osteoarthritis. I suspect he may well require a total joint replacement at some point in the future, but the good news is there's no metal work in the glenoid that we will have to contend with at the time of his surgery. These x-rays demonstrate a revision eden hibernay procedure for a failed coracoid transfer in which the screws have snapped and the shafts have been retained within the glenoid. The suture buttons were able to bypass the retained metal work. The majority of bone loss problems associated with anterior instability can be addressed by either a bone block or coracoid transfer procedure on the front of the glenoid. However, there are some situations where the heel sax lesion posteriorly needs to be considered. Surgery for heel sax lesions is really considered at both ends of the spectrum. A remplissage may be used where there's only modest anterior bone loss with a heel sax lesion and an osteochondral allograft or various arthroplasty procedures where there's a massive heel sax defect. Occasionally, where there's only a modest amount of glenoid defect with a large heel sax lesion, a soft tissue procedure on its own may not be considered sufficient to prevent engagement of the heel sax lesion. An infraspinatus rhomplossage procedure involves decorticating the heel sax lesion and then securing the infraspinatus tendon into this defect. 
The rationale is that this will decrease external rotation, helping to stabilize the shoulder. This is a procedure that can be done relatively easily at the time of a soft tissue band cart repair. You can see on the arthroscopic images that the defect has been prepared and the suture has passed through the tendon. And the second image shows the tendon tied down. This procedure was quite popular a few years ago but has recently fallen out of fashion. My personal opinion is that it is a counterintuitive procedure in that it restricts external rotation. If there are any concerns with regards to engagement of a heel sax lesion, even if there's a modest amount of glenoid loss, I would still prefer to undertake a procedure at the front of the glenoid, either a coracoid transfer or a bone block procedure. The other situation is where there's a massive heel sax lesion present. These are very rare and tend to only occur with patients who have severe epilepsy. In this situation, despite undertaking a glenoid procedure, either a coracoid transfer or a bone block, the heel sax lesion is so large that it still continues to engage. There are a number of ways to address this problem. I prefer to use an osteochondral allograft coupled with either a bone block procedure or a coracoid transfer. This is a pre-op x-ray of a patient with epilepsy. He had undergone a successful latter J procedure three years previously that had healed. His epilepsy had recurred and he had a succession of severe fits breaking his bone block and creating a very large hill sax defect. This is his post-operative images where we've undertaken an osteochondral anagraft and we've revised his lache procedure with an Eden Hibernate procedure using the suture buttons bypassed in the retained screw shafts. Another option is to use a hemicap implant to fill the hill sax defect, once again coupled with an anterior bone block procedure. Here's a post-operative x-ray of a hemicap procedure coupled with a lache procedure. Very occasionally the bone loss is so severe that an osteochondral allograft or a hemicap are not sufficient to fill this defect. In this instance, a hemi or total shoulder replacement may be considered. In summary, anterior instability with bone loss is a complex dynamic problem and can often only truly be appreciated at the time of surgery. There is not a single procedure that will provide a solution to all problems. As a result, any surgeon considering taking on this type of surgery should be conversant with multiple procedures. For anterior loss on the glenoid, a bone block procedure or coracoid transfer may be considered and in the unusual circumstances where there's a massive heel sax lesion, an osteochondral allograft or various types of arthroplasties may be options. If you've enjoyed this talk and would like to find out more about bone loss or other shoulder problems, you may wish to visit my website cambridgeshoulder.co.uk.